Hello friends. Since this is my first session with Agam, I would like to introduce myself before I start off with the session. Myself Karthikeyan, second year MBBS from Tagore Medical College. So today's topic is a very, very important essay question asked thrice in the university exam. And we can expect a short notes too. It's none other than tongue. So before I start off with the session, I, I want you all to orient with my session. So I would like to tell how my slides will be and how you're supposed to attend the session. My slides will mostly contain hand drawn pictures. So I want you all to observe the picture, listen to my audio and take down the points, whichever you feel it is important. And at the end of the session, you can just go through these points and while you are reading, it will be helpful. So I'll start off with the topic. So as an essay, so the side headings under which you will include the topic is you will give a general introduction of about one or two lines followed by external features, muscles and movements, blood supply, lymphatic drainage, nerve supply and development of tongue. So as a short note, you can expect muscles and movement is a very important short note and development of tongue is also another very important short note and nerve supply. It is important for your practicals for both anatomy and physiology and you can expect an OSPI chart from nerve supply of tongue in your practicals. So introductions, as you all know, if it is an essay, they expect you to write one or two line introduction. So for our tongue, if you include these two points in the introduction, it is more than enough. It is a mobile muscular organ present in the oral cavity, which is conical in shape and flattened dorsoventrally. So we have described its location where it is present, that is in the oral cavity, its nature. So it is a muscular organ. We have described about this shape that is conical in shape. And we have also added a very beautiful point that is flattened dorsoventrally. So it's a mobile muscular organ in oral cavity, conical in shape, flattened dorsoventrally. So these points will suffice your introduction. Now moving on to external features of tongue. So this in your essay carries very important a uh, point. So we'll start understanding the external features. If you take tongue as three external features, that is you can study tongue at three levels. This is your root and this is your tip and the region between your root and the tip is called as your body. So this is your root, this is your body and this is your tip. So what you must know, so you are supposed to describe these three external features. So in root, what you must know in tip and in body, we will see. So first thing is your root. So when this question is asked under external features, you will write the first thing is root. Under that, the first point is the root of the tongue is attached to two bony structures. That is your mandible and your aioid bone. So the root of the tongue is attached to mandible and aioid bone by means of muscular attachments. So this will be your first point under root. I'll repeat. The root of the tongue is attached to mandible and aioid bone by means of muscular attachments. The second point under that is since because the root of the tongue has a very strong muscular attachments, it is not being swallowed during deglutition. You all would have wondered in your childhood why our tongue is also not swallowing, is not being swallowed during deglutition and how it is strongly fixed in the oral cavity. The reason is this root of the tongue is attached to bony, atta bony prominence or your bony structures by means of strong muscular attachments. So these two points you will include under root. Then it's your tip. Tip you have nothing. This one point is enough. Tip represents the free anterior end of the tongue. Okay. So root two points we have seen. Tip we have seen only one and only point that is it has a free anterior end of the tongue is your tip. Now next moving on to your body. Body of the tongue is very, very important. You have lots of structures to be described and understood. So if you take body of the tongue, you have two surfaces to be studied. The dorsal surface and then your ventral surface. So you go and stand in front of the mirror. You are just going to protrude your tongue. The surface that you see. Okay, so while you brush, you are just using the 
back side of your uh, brush to just clean your tongue. So the surface that you're actually cleaning is your dorsal surface. So what appears in front of the mirror is your dorsal surface and the other side is going to be ventral surface. So body is very important. You need to elaborate in dorsal surface what are the structures present and you need to elaborate about these that structures and in ventral surface what are the structures present. We'll make it as simple as possible. So I hope you are clear with this slide. Three features, the root, tip and the body. Root, it is attached to mandible and aoid bone by means of muscular attachments. That is why it is not swallowed during deglutition. Tip is being represented by the free anterior end of the tongue. And body, we have two surfaces, the dorsal surface and the ventral surface. So this is an and andron uh, diagram. Again, we will start with the dorsal surface. So how you are supposed to write dorsal surfaces? You are going to start off with a particular structure called a sulcus terminalis. So if you observe this picture carefully, just observe my uh, mouse arrow. I am moving this arrow across a V-shaped structure, right? So the V-shaped structure, which is going to divide the dorsal surface into two zones. If you take, this is your V-shaped sulcus, so it, is, it is appearing V in shape. So you have one part here, you have another part here. Okay, so the V-shaped sulcus divides your dorsal surface into two parts. This is your oral part. So this is your oral part and this is your pharyngeal part. This structure is called as sulcus terminalis. So under dorsal surface, the first thing that you will write is about sulcus terminalis, which can be defined as V-shaped sulcus that divides your dorsal surface. So the V-shaped sulcus that divides the dorsal surface of the tongue into two parts. This is your oral part and this is your pharyngeal part. So next point you are supposed to highlight on a structure called foramen cecum. How will you define this? The apex of your sulcus terminalis, it gives rise to a structure called thyroglossal duct in your embryonic life. That portion is called as foramen cecum. I'll repeat, the apex of the sulcus terminalis presents with a structure called foramen cecum that gives rise to thyroglossal duct in your embryonic life. So you, you all would have uh, seen in the previous video about your thyroglossal duct in development of thyroid. So thyro thyroglossal duct is one which actually gives rise to your thyroid gland. Okay, along with few more structures that you would have seen there. So remember in dorsal surface, very, very important thing is your sulcus terminalis. Its apex contain a structure called foramen cecum. What is the importance that you must write? It contains an embryological structure called thyroglossal duct, only present in your embryonic life. Okay. Now, parts, if you take, you have two parts as we have discussed the oral part and the pharyngeal part. Generally, this oral part is referred to as anterior two third, and your pharyngeal part is referred to as posterior one third. So oral part is your anterior two-third of your tongue and pharyngeal part is posterior one-third of the tongue. So oral part is going to contain something called median furrow and papillae and pharyngeal part contains lingual tonsils. So we will see all this in detail. So in this slide, you must just understand two terminologies, your sulcus terminalis and then your foramen cecum. Now, now we will study about anterior two-third of the tongue that is your oral surface. So oral part, we have seen, we have two important structures, your median furrow and then your papillae. So median furrow is very simple. If you take, during your embryological uh, life, your tongue is going to show a bilateral origin. That is, it is going to divide, it is going to form from two structures present laterally. We will study in development, okay? So this median furrow represents development of tongue bilaterally in the embryological life. That is the significance. Again, I'll repeat, the median furrow present in the anterior two-third of the tongue is representing the bilateral origin of tongue during embryological life. Okay, so you will have two different swellings and also we'll see in embryological, just know this point alone. Now moving on to papillae. 
very important usually students tend to forget papillae even my professor used to say please include papillae if tongue is asked as an essay okay so papillae is very important you just have to include only one or two points regarding each papillae that's it okay so if you take you have four types of papillae that is described here okay so you have something called valate papillae you have something called filiform papillae you have something called fungiform papillae and this is your foliate papillae so this is your valate papillae this structure is your foliate papillae this is your filiform papillae and all these are your fungiform papillae so this is your diagram that we drew from your textbook so if you take this particular structure represents your filiform papillae this represents your fungiform papillae this represents your valate papillae so you are expected to draw these three diagrams we have not included about foliate papillae even in the picture because foliate papillae is almost rudimentary in human beings it is mostly found in rabbits but uh, rudimentary in human beings okay now we will concentrate on each of the papillae so as far as papillae is concerned now you should understand what is a papillae just take down the definition of papillae it is the folding of lamina propria of the mucous membrane of the tongue again i'll repeat papillae is nothing but it is a pointed structure or a pointed fold formed as a result of folding of lamina propria of the mucous membrane around your tongue this is your papillae so how it is been uh, shaped where it is located what is its function so based on this you have types of papillae so the first papillae is your valate papillae so you need to uh, write some extra points about valate papillae so if valate papillae is asked what are the points you are supposed to include the first point under valate papillae is its location so if you observe this picture carefully i discussed in the last slide that this is your sulcus terminalis so your valate papillae is aligned along your sulcus terminalis so if you take your valate papillae is present along this v shaped sulcus right so the first point you will write it is aligned along your sulcus terminalis the second point you are supposed to comment on its shape if you take the shape of the valate papillae is truncated cone and it is surrounded by a circular sulcus so if you take this picture you are able to see two rounds two circles right so this is your valate papillae this white color thing what you are able to see it is going to be truncated cone in shape and this in turn is going to be surrounded by one more circular sulcus so the second point is it is truncated cone in shape surrounded by a circular sulcus and the third point it is the largest papillae found in the tongue so i'll repeat the three points the first point its location that it is aligned along your sulcus terminalis second point it is truncated cone in shape with a circular sulcus surrounding it third point it is the largest papillae found with taste buds okay if you take this is your picture of a valid papillae you have many taste buds here right so it is with your many taste buds so these are the three points that you will include along valid papillae next we have seen about foliate papillae i have already told it is rudimentary human beings and abundantly found in rabbits if you read these two points it is more than enough now coming on to filiform papillae again this is important filiform papillae if you take it is distributed so first thing you see its location right so it is distributed over the dorsum of the tongue so if you take you have uh, many small small dots okay if you take it is distributed all over the tongue almost okay so it is distributed all over the dorsum of the tongue the second point its shape it is presenting as a conical projections so if you take this picture you have some projections okay so it is going to be presented as a conical projections so it is distributed all over the dorsum of the tongue it is conically projected and the third point is it is the most numerous papillae found your valid papillae was the largest papillae but your uh, filiform papillae it is abundantly found in your tongue okay so count wise your filiform papillae dominate the tongue size wise your valid papillae dominate the tongue so largest papillae in the tongue na valid papillae 
numerous papillae found now it is going to be filiform papillae so all these could be your possible mcq questions okay to confuse you so just make note of all these keywords and the final point that you must know is velvety appearance of the tongue if you see the uh, appearance of the tongue it is going to be more like a velvet right so velvety appearance of the tongue is because of filiform papillae so abundantly found all distributed all over the dorsum of the tongue responsible for velvety appearance so these points you are supposed to include under filiform papillae now coming on to fungiform papillae so fungiform papillae if you take from the picture you are able to understand it is present only in your margins of the tongue it is nowhere related to your body of your tongue right so it is only related to your margins of the tongue so first point is location your fungiform papillae is distributed over the margins of the tongue okay second point is going to be appearing reddish in shape okay so it almost going to appear reddish in shape it has some taste but that's it. these points if you include it is enough so this is regarding papillae so friends do not forget to include about papillae in your exam so valid papillae foliate papillae filiform papillae fungiform papillae remember the papillae in this order and try to memorize the points also in this order always you will get confused sometimes even last year what i did was for filiform i wrote about foliate so i made all these mess so remember so first you will have two ate coming together so valid foliate then two forms coming together filiform fungiform i comes first in your alphabet so it is going to be in the top u comes last in your alphabet so it is going to be in your bottom so remember like this or remember whatever way you can so that you will not make any mistake i hope you are clear with the papillae now so so far we have seen only oral part that is your anterior two third i'll repeat myself again your oral part contains a median furrow which represents bilateral origin of your tongue in your embryonic life you have papillae so you have four types valid foliate filiform fungiform valid is the largest papillae truncated cone in shape filiform is your numerous abundantly found in tongue responsible for velvety appearance okay hope you are clear with your oral part now we will move on to the pharyngeal part that is posterior one third of the tongue so far we have covered only this portion what happened to this portion only one thing you must remember as far as your pharyngeal part is concerned it is been or you can say it contains aggregation of lymphoid follicles if you take all these round round structures that are present all these are your lymphoid follicles so all these are going to aggregate together to form something called as lingual tonsil so always remember tonsil is nothing but aggregation of your lymphoid follicles so wherever it is going to form an aggregation it is called as a tonsil so since the aggregation of lymphoid uh, follicles are present in your tongue it is called lingual tonsil It is going to be present along the pharyngeal wall. It is called as palatine tonsil along your palate and your pharyngeal level. It is called as your palatine tonsil. We shall be seeing in the further videos. So, lymphoid follicle aggregation of lymphoid follicles that is your lingual tonsil is found in your pharyngeal part or your posterior one third of the tongue. This is the first point. The second most important thing you must try is you should try to cover this structure. So, if you take what is this actually is remember. in your anterior two third we saw your mucous membrane is been um, that is lamina propria of your mucous membrane is been put as your projection so you have papillae but in your posterior one third you do not have any uh, folding and all but what happens is so the mucous membrane over this pharyngeal part okay so this is your epiglottis this is your tongue so the mucous membrane from your pharyngeal part that is your posterior one third of the tongue is going to extend posteriorly okay if you take just see my mouse arrow so here you will going to have your mucous membrane that is your posterior one third of the tongue so this mucous membrane is going to extend posteriorly in front of your epiglottis and at the same time mucous membrane is going to go along your lateral walls of your pharynx so your mucous membrane it takes two different paths one it goes commonly it is going to extend posteriorly once it extends posteriorly goes to two different places one right in front of your epiglottis okay is so one in right in front of epiglottis and remaining it is going to go along your lateral walls of your pharynx so the fold of mucous membrane which extends posteriorly from 
pharyngeal part of the tongue to your front of epiglottis is called as median glosso epiglottic fold i'll repeat myself the fold of mucous membrane extending from posterior one third of the tongue till your front of epiglottis is called as median glosso epiglottic fold the fold of mucous membrane from posterior one third of the tongue along your lateral walls of your pharynx is called as lateral glosso epiglottic fold median which means middle glosso tongue epiglottic epiglottis okay so median glosso epiglottic fold lateral means laterally it is going to go to your uh, epiglottis so glosso epiglottic fold okay so this is what you must know okay the next thing something called as valvula what is this valvula is now if you take this is your median glosso epiglottic fold and this line represents your lateral glosso epiglottic fold the region or the space between your median glosso epiglottic fold and your lateral glosso epiglottic fold is called as your valvula okay so as far as your pharyngeal part is concerned you will talk about lingual tonsils is aggregation of lymphoid follicles then you will write the mucous membrane over this pharyngeal part extends posteriorly to your front of your epiglottis and also along your lateral wall of the pharynx the former that is your uh, this is called as your median glosso epiglottic fold and the lateral is called as your lateral glosso epiglottic fold and the space of the region between this median glosso epiglottic fold and this lateral glosso epiglottic fold is called as your valvula so so far we have seen only about your dorsal surface so oral part sulcus so seminalis foramen cecum pyroglossal duct oral part pharyngeal part so we have seen about the papillae here we have seen about the pharyngeal part here now you remember your tongue has one more surface on the other side that is called as ventral surface ventral surface is very simple just remember you have only three structures ventral surface is very simple okay that is the first structure so we'll go from medial to lateral okay so the first structure that you will see is called as your frenulum lingue it's called as your frenulum lingue okay so this structure that i am showing here is your frenulum lingue so what is this frenulum lingue is the fold of mucous membrane that connects your ventral surface of the tongue to floor of your mouth So if you see, just op, uh, just go in front of your mirror, open your mouth, fold your tongue, okay, or roll your tongue backwards. You will be able to appreciate a thin structure that connects your tongue to your floor floor of your mouth. That structure is called as your frenulum lingue. So the fold of mucous membrane that connects your ventral surface of the tongue to your floor of mouth is called as frenulum lingue. So it is going to appear medially, okay, in the middle. laterally to your frenulum lingue you are going to have a vein that is called as your deep lingual vein and the lateral lateral most structure is called as your plica fimbriata what is this plica fimbriata if you take you have some foldings right so these foldings are called as fimbriations okay so this is nothing but the fimbriated fold of your mucous membrane that is going to be present laterally so if you take this is present laterally right so from laterally this fimbriated fold is going to come forwards to your tip of your tongue just observe my mouse arrow so this fimbriated folding is going to fold like this it is going to come all the way anteriorly to the tip of the tongue this is your plica fimbriata so what you must write is the fimbriated fold of mucous membrane which is present laterally on the ventral surface of the tongue and moves forward to reach the tip of the tongue fimbriated fold of mucous membrane present laterally it comes forwards to reach your tip of the tongue this is your plica fimbriata so frenulum lingue plica fimbriata deep lingual vein these structures we saw so always remember when you write external features write from medial to lateral So the first is your frenulum lingue, followed by your deep lingual vein, followed by your plica fimbriata. Okay. So always done. One more thing. So with this, your external features is done. Next is clinical anatomy. Here I want to stress on one point. For people who are following latest version of your Vishram Singh, in most of the topics, they have given you a clinical anatomy at the end. That is, they have uh, described all the contents first. 
and we have discrete green color anatomy separately at the end. Do not do that. Okay, in your exam, under that particular topic, if you have some clinical correlation, mention there itself because it presents to an examiner in such a way that okay, the student has understood why this structure is present and if such this structure goes on, how the patient presents clinically. So they will understand you correlate anatomy with your clinical experience. Okay, so it's better you include under every sided thing. So for your external features, what is the clinical anatomy is something called tongue type. Most of you uh, know about this. So if you take this picture, so this is, as I said, if you just uh, put your tongue, roll your tongue upwards, you'll be able to appreciate a structure connecting your ventral surface to your floor of your mouth. That is your frenulum lingue, right? Now, if you take this frenulum lingue as its own limitation, that is, it can extend only to certain extent. But in tongue tie, what happens is, if there is over extension of this frenulum lingue, so if you take almost that, this uh, fold has come here, if you take this attachment is somewhere here, right? So over extension of frenulum lingue is called as tongue tie. So what happens in tongue tie is there will be disturbances in speech, your movements of tongue and all that. Okay. So clinical anatomy, you will put tongue tie over extension of frenulum lingue will lead on to speech disturbances and also disturbs the movement of tongue. This condition is called tongue tie. That's it. Enough. Okay. So I hope you are clear with the external features. Now the next important topic, which I told it can be asked in your short notes is your muscles of the tongue. So if you take muscles of the tongue, you have two groups of muscles to be studied. That is your intrinsic group of muscles and extrinsic group of muscles. And you remember the median furrow. So you, if you take on one side of your tongue, you will be having totally eight muscles. If you see this picture, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then you will have one more muscle which is not being reflected here. Okay. So you will have totally eight muscles, four on each, four intrinsic muscles, four extrinsic muscles. Okay. So what are the intrinsic muscles? So you should understand why these group of muscles are present. So what is the basic difference? Understand this intrinsic group of muscles are going to be present within the tongue, which means they do not have any external appearance over the tongue or external attachments over the tongue. Whereas an extrinsic group of muscles are going to have external attachments. Okay. From the tongue. So, this intrinsic muscle which is present within the tongue is responsible for change in shape of the tongue. Whereas extrinsic muscles you take, it is responsible for causing movements. Okay, you protrude your tongue, you take your tongue, that is you retract your tongue, you elevate your tongue, you depress your tongue. So whatever movements you are going to do, it is concerned with your extrinsic muscle. Whereas your intrinsic muscle is responsible for change in shape. You should understand this basic difference. With this knowledge, we will move on to first intrinsic muscles. So remember the intrinsic muscle in this order. So if you take intrinsic muscles, you have first thing superior longitudinal muscle. Next is your inferior longitudinal muscle. Then you have your transverse muscle, then your vertical muscle. So if you take, you are going to have four group of intrinsic muscles, superior longitudinal, inferior longitudinal, transverse and vertical. So remember the muscle or muscle name in this order. So it will be easy for you to understand its actions. So as far as the intrinsic muscle is concerned, name of the muscle, its action, location is not that important. Just name of the muscle is action. Very simple. If you take the first muscle, it's your superior longitudinal muscle, right? So if you take, the arrangement of fibers is in this manner. So what will happen? Contraction of this muscle is going to increase the concavity of the dorsum of the tongue. You just have to imagine the muscle is going to pull the tongue like this. So what is going to happen as a result? Your concavity increases. So contraction of your superior longitudinal muscle causes concavity or increases the concavity of dorsum of the tongue. So this is what is given here makes the dorsum concave. Next is your inferior longitudinal muscle which is present here. So it is going to pull the tongue upwards. So it is going to make the dorsum convex. 
so your superior longitudinal muscle responsible for your concavity of your dorsum of your tongue and the inferior longitudinal muscle is responsible for convexity of your dorsum so if you take your fibers arranged in this manner it is going to pull the dorsum upwards so causes convexity just observe my mouse arrow so the superior longitudinal muscle is going to pull downwards so it is going to cause concavity superior longitudinal muscle concavity inferior longitudinal muscle convexity now coming on to vertical and your transverse group of muscles so if you take transverse group of muscles it is arranged like this so contraction of your transverse group of muscles is going to make the tongue narrow on a long it is always remember when you try to decrease the breadth of a structure or the width of the structure it tends to be elongated so your transverse group of muscles makes the tongue narrow here and elongated as so your vertical group of muscle it makes the tongue flattened and broad okay so this is what you must know so if you are going to remember the muscle in this order so if you take superior longitudinal and inferior longitudinal its actions are opposite similarly your transverse and vertical they are going to be opposite so transverse narrows and elongates superior longitudinal makes the dorsum concave so if you remember these two you can write the actions of the other two do not try to remember all the four sometimes you can tend to confuse okay this is about your intrinsic group of muscles now moving on to extrinsic group of muscles so if you take extrinsic group of muscles which is a very good picture that we have seen thanks to my friend so if you take genioglossus hyoglossus palatoglossus and then styloglossus so it's a beautifully uh, drawn diagram so as far as extrinsic muscle is concerned you should just know origin insertion in one single term genio which means what something related to your genial okay so origin of this genioglossal muscle is from your superior genial tubercle so this is a superior genial tubercle so your muscle fibers are arising from your superior genial tubercle and it is inserted into your tongue so glossus right so tongue so superior genial tubercle it goes all the way to your tongue next is your hyoglossus so it is going to be from your hyoid always remember this particular uh, structure in hyoid bone greater cornea of hyoid bone it almost gives rise to many structures so greater cornea of hyoid bone to your tongue so if you take this hyoglossal muscle so it goes all the way from your greater cornea of hyoid bone to your tongue so this is your hyoglossal muscle next is your palatoglossal origin is from your palate insertion again to your tongue and styloglossus styloid process and styloid ligament to your tongue <clears throat> So genioglossus, superior genial tubercle to your tongue. Hyoglossus, greater cornea of hyoid bone to your tongue. Palatoglossus from your palate to your tongue. Styloglossus from your styloid process and styloid ligament to your tongue. Now, its movements, as I told already, your extrinsic muscle is concerned with your movement of your tongue. So for which I have made an acronym. If you see this particular uh, column, I have arranged the extrinsic muscle in alphabetical order. G H P S, genioglossal, hyoglossal, palatoglossus, styloglossus. So remember the muscles in this alphabetical order, and remember the acronym PEDA, P D E R. So your genioglossal muscle is concerned with your protrusion of the tongue. Your hyoglossal muscle is concerned with your depression of your tongue. Palatoglossal elevation of the tongue. Styloglossal retraction of the tongue. Okay, so genioglossal protrusion, hyoglossal depression, palatoglossal elevation, styloglossal retraction. Now, what is the clinical anatomy? If you take, so always remember I said, as of now we are talking only about one side of the tongue. So the same muscles with the same origin, with the same insertion, you have on the other side. Okay, so this genioglossal is very, very, very important. So before I move on to the next slide where I have a picture, I would like to explain this concept. If you take genioglossal, it is called as safety muscle of the tongue. Why? Because it almost forms the major bulk of the tongue. And almost, and second point that you need to remember is, do not think unilateral contraction of these muscles will produce this movement. Mean to say, one side if the muscle is working properly, it can cause these movements. No. Remember. Both the sides muscle has to contract simultaneously for causing all these movements. If you take protrusion, 
the genioglossal muscle present on both the sides of the tongue has to contract simultaneously for causing protrusion of the tongue why i'm stressing only on genioglossal muscle is your very very important clinical anatomy that is deviation of tongue okay if you take normal protrusion you just go right in front of your mirror you just protrude your tongue it will be correctly or aligned at the center but here if you take this picture your tongue is deviated slightly to your right so this almost this ospi chart is present in every college and you will also uh, need to know about this in your physiology cns practical examiner's favorite question which side of the muscle is paralyzed which side it deviates why it deviates so there are lots of question but we will try to understand the concept very easily so as i told remember so genioglossal muscle in this side as well as in this side is responsible for protrusion of tongue normally if you take this picture the deviation of the tongue is towards the right hand side so what is happening your left genioglossal muscle is contracting very strongly so it is pushing your tongue towards your right but what is happening your right genioglossal muscle is not contracting that is why it is not able to push the tongue again to the left so always remember both the muscle will contract simultaneously to protrude the tongue along the center so in this case since your right genioglossal muscle is not able to contract the nerve supplying the genioglossal muscle is being paralyzed it is not showing a counter attack so what is happening tongue is deviated to the right side so what you need to understand is examiner will ask which side of this person is paralyzed so you have to say right side always remember the muscle paralysis happens in the deviated side in this picture the right side deviation is seen so the right side muscle is going to be paralyzed if examiner ask you to explain you need to say for protrusion of tongue along your central axis you need to have equal contraction of both the genioglossal muscle but in this case since your right genioglossal muscle is paralyzed the uh, muscle is not able to counter attack the force done by your left genioglossal muscle so left genioglossal muscle is pakka whereas the right genioglossal muscle is paralyzed so in hence it is deviated so this is one way of asking which side is paralyzed the second way will ask which side of the muscle is normal so your opposite side okay so this is what you need to remember so take over point is if the tongue is deviated towards the right right side paralysis are taken place if it is deviated towards the left side left side muscle had been paralyzed that's it okay so we have made the thing i hope i have made the thing simpler so your muscles all are just done now we will move on to blood supply we'll make it very simple so always remember when you take blood supply you need to mention of both both your arteries and your veins so usually people in urgency they tend to forget vein venous supply do not do that if you take your blood supply that is your arterial supply of tongue you need to write these three points branches of your lingual artery tonsillar branch of your facial artery ascending pharyngeal artery now branches of lingual artery so you just have to remember the names of the branches so if you take this is your external carotid artery and this is your lingual artery so first thing how will you present a blood supply always remember when you write a name of an artery you are supposed to mention its branch okay people tend to write stories it goes 2.25 cm lateral inside outside medial lateral everything do not do all that as far as your arterial supply is concerned name of the artery from which branch it is coming that's more than enough so if you take i have written branches of lingual artery so you should mention lingual artery is a branch of So, if you take lingual artery, it's a branch of external carotid artery. So now, what are the branches? You have two branches: deep lingual artery, and then this is your dorsal lingual artery. Okay, so these two branches of lingual artery supply your tongue. So why I am stressing on the name of the branches is this deep lingual artery is going to supply the tip of the tongue. Okay, so what is happening here is there is an anastomosis found in the tip of the tongue so the deep lingual artery of one side anastomosis with the deep lingual artery that comes from the other side at the tip of the tongue and the, you have your dorsal lingual artery to supply your 
dorsum of your tongue. So branches of your lingual artery, consular branch of your facial artery, and then your ascending pharyngeal artery. So these two branches supply your posterior one third of your tongue, and these lingual arteries supply your anterior two third of your tongue. Okay, so always remember name of the artery, its branch area of supply. So if you take, we have discussed so lingual artery. So first number one portrait, you are supposed to say lingual artery branch of external carotid artery, and its branches deep lingual artery. Anastomosis with the deep lingual artery, the tip of the tongue on the other side. Dorsal lingual artery supplies the anterior two third of dorsum of the tongue. Consular branch of facial artery number two. So you have put again facial artery. You have put which in turn is again a branch of external carotid artery. Supplies posterior one third of the tongue. Again ascending pharyngeal artery supplies posterior one third of the tongue. If you are going to write this much, you will get maximum marks. Okay. Next is venous supply. As far as venous supply is concerned, not only in tongue, any structure, you are supposed to use the term drain. You should not write the term branch here. In the arterial supply, we saw lingual artery, it's a branch of external carotid artery. Here, you should not use the term branch, you should use the term drain. Okay. So, for your tongue, if you take, you have three arteries, deep lingual vein, sorry, sorry, venous supply, you have deep lingual veins, three veins, sorry. Okay. Deep lingual veins is going to be present along ventral surface of the tongue. Next is your vena committance accompanying your lingual artery, vena committance accompanying the hypoglossal nerve. So, vena committance means small, small branches, tiny branches of your veins, that is your vena committance. So, those tiny branches which is along the lingual artery, those tiny branches accompanying your hypoglossal nerve. So, these three veins, they drain venous blood from your tongue. Just observe my term, I have used the term drain. So, what happens is, all these, this blue color highlighted point is very important. All these three structures, they are going to unite together to form lingual vein, which drains into common facial vein or your internal jugular vein. Its drainage is very important. Deep lingual vein, vena committance, vena committance, hypoglossal nerve, lingual vein drains into common facial vein or your internal jugular vein. Moving on to lymphatic drainage. Again, clinical anatomy of put here, very, very, very important. Before that, we'll go on to lymphatic drainage. Again, this is an important short note that being asked separately twice in your university exam. So, as far as your lymphatic drainage is concerned, you need to mention what are the groups of vessels present. As far as your tongue is concerned, you have four groups of vessels. Your apical vessels, which is your first group. So, if you observe the picture here, beautifully drawn, your first is your apical vessels. Next is your marginal vessels. Okay, then you have one more group called central vessels. It's going to drain, I'll tell you. Then finally is your basal vessels. So you have four group of vessels, your apical, marginal, central and then basal vessels. So you need to know from which area these vessels are going to drain, where it is going to go and give its uh, content. That's it, okay. So if you take apical vessels, it is going to drain the apex of the tongue. So again, very clear from the term apical vessel. So apex of the tongue. So the lymph from the apex of the tongue drained by apical vessels sends its lymph to your submental nodes. So this is your afferent fibers, AFF, afferent fibers. So what happens to efferent is, if you take efferents, some of the efferents via your submental nodes will go to your jugulo homoeoid nodes. And some of the efferents from your submental nodes will go on to your submandibular nodes. And from there it drains into your deep cervical nodes also. So efferent fibers drains into jugulo homoeoid nodes directly from your submental nodes or sometimes goes to your submandibular nodes and then drains into your deep cervical nodes and your jugulo homoeoid nodes. So this is with your apical vessel. So apex of the tongue, submental nodes from there goes to submandibular or your jugulo homoeoid lymph nodes. Next is your marginal vessels is going to drain your margins of your tongue. Okay, again uh, from your uh, name it is self-explanatory. So margins of the tongue of anterior two-third. Okay, so to be uh, in simplified form, drains anterior two-third of the tongue margin. Okay, very important. So it is all going to drain its contents again into your deep cervical nodes and also your jugulo homoeoid nodes. So marginal vessels, margins of your anterior two thirds of the tongue into your jugulo homoeoid and then your deep cervical nodes. Next is your central vessels. 
your body of your anterior two third of the tongue again drains into your deep cervical lymph nodes. That's why I told marginal vessels will drain only lymph from your margins of the anterior two third of the tongue, but whereas your central vessels will drain from your central part of your anterior two third of your tongue into your deep cervical nodes, and then you have your basal vessels which is going to drain your posterior one third of the tongue to your jugular digastric and also to your deep cervical nodes. So four group of vessels. Where it from where it is going to drain and to which node it is going to deliver the drainage. That's it. Okay. I hope you understood. Now clinical anatomy is very important. So you all know you would have seen in some movie uh, as a statutory warning also. In your oral cavity, trunk tongue cancer is the most commonest cancer, right? So prognosis. What is prognosis? That is you you are able to analyze a medical condition. Okay, so a doctor, if he is able to tell, okay, this is how the course of the disease is going to be. This is how the patient will present in this particular day. So if he is able to actually understand how the disease is progressing, then that is said to be a good prognosis. If he is not able to understand, or if he is not able to predict how the disease will go, it is called bad prognosis. So if you take prognosis of tongue cancer. As I said, in anterior two third, it is a different prognostic value, and posterior one third has different prognostic value. Why? Because if you take, as I already stressed on the point, your posterior one third of the tongue, it is drained by your basal vessels. What you must know here is the basal vessels draining the posterior one third of the tongue is well anastomosed. With the basal vessels draining the other part of your posterior one third of the tongue, I'll repeat myself. So this is your one side, one half of your tongue, right? So the basal vessels draining one half of your posterior one third of the tongue is well anastomosed with your basal basal vessels draining your another half of your posterior one third of the tongue. Now. Since there is proper anastomosis happening, so what will happen? Say, suppose in my right half, right posterior part, my cancer is being uh, proliferating. There is a very good chance that this cancer can travel to the other side because since it is well anastomosed, which means it has a very good connection. So from one side it can travel to other side. So it has high chances of both contralateral, which means opposite side, as well as ipsilateral. Movement of your cancerous cells, so hence it is very difficult to diagnose where actually the cancer had been originated, right? So your cancer in your posterior one third of your tongue has a poor prognosis because of the anastomosis of the basal vessels. Whereas if you take anterior two third of the tongue, you do not have such well marked anastomosis, so prognosis is good. This is the clinical anatomy. So basal vessels. Anastomosis posterior one third ends bad prognosis. Anterior two third not well marked anastomosis ends good prognosis of tongue cancer. That's it. Okay. Now, now supply again important for your practicals especially. Okay. What you must understand is what is the motor supply? What is the sensory supply? Your motor supply is very simple. All your muscles of the tongue are supplied by your hypoglossal nerve. So if you take um, This is written here. All muscles of the tongue is supplied by hypoglossal nerve except palatoglossus. Very very important point. Your palatoglossus is supplied by your cranial root of accessory via vagus nerve. Cranial root of accessory via vagus nerve. So all muscles of tongue are supplied by your hypoglossal nerve except your palatoglossal muscle, which is supplied by your cranial root of accessory via your vagus nerve. Now. Coming on to your sensory supply, okay. You, here you just know the points that you must know. We will be dealing why each part has a different nerve supply in the next slide. That is when we talk about the embryology. Okay. So if you take sensory supply, as we all know, we have two parts: your anterior two third and then your posterior one third, right? So anterior two third, if you take the sensory supply, is from your lingual nerve and then your cauda tympani nerve. So, your lingual nerve is supplying your general sensation, and your cauda tympani is supplying your special sensation. So, lingual nerve from where it is coming. Just make a note: mandibular branch of your trigeminal nerve. 
Okay, so one of the mandibular branch from the trigeminal nerve is your lingual nerve. And your cauda tympani nerve is a branch of your facial nerve. So anterior two third is supplied by two nerves, your lingual nerve and then your cauda tympani nerve. If you take your posterior one third of your tongue, it is supplied by your glossopharyngeal nerve, which is your ninth cranial nerve, which takes care of your both general and then special sensations. And posterior most, it is supplied by your internal laryngeal nerve that is going to again supply general and special sensory sensations. Okay, so you just have to understand what is the supply of your anterior power one, two third, posterior one third and posterior most. You will see how, why there is difference in your nerve supplies. Okay, so coming on to the last slide, important short notes, that is development of your tongue. So what are you must understand? So first thing that you must write, as far as any question regarding development, the first thing, when the development is going to begin. Okay, so here what you will write is, the development of the tongue is going to begin around the fourth week of your embryonic life. It begins around fourth week of your embryonic life. the first point. Then you should start writing about the development. So please understand, actually you have something called pharyngeal arches which will be dealt to you in further sessions. So you have four pharyngeal arches, one, two, three and four. Okay, so if you're able to see, here they have written one, two, three and four, right? So these are the four pharyngeal arches present. So how will you start your answer is, the first point I have told you, fourth week of embryonic life. The second thing you will write is, there appears two lateral swellings and one median swelling derived from the first pharyngeal arch. Again, I'll repeat, there appears two lateral swellings and one median swelling which is derived from the first pharyngeal arch. So if you take this orange color, so you have two lateral swellings and one median swelling confined within your first pharyngeal arch. Right. So this median swelling is called as tuberculum impa. So this appears first, followed by more median swelling. So you are going to have a median swelling appearing which is derived from second and the third pharyngeal arch that is called as copula or your hypobranchial eminence. So there appears a one more median swelling later derived from the second and the third pharyngeal arch that is your copula or your hypobranchial eminence. And you have one more swelling appearing from your fourth pharyngeal arch which is epiglottal swelling. Now what happens actually is, so all these appears uh, in order and all these swellings will start to grow in size. So if you take these lateral swellings will grow in size and dominates the growth of your median swelling. So this is this growth is going to be more dominant than the growth of median swelling. So what happens? All these cells is going to cover your tuberculum impa. So what happens? Your two lateral swelling along with your tuberculum impar, all these are going to fuse forming your anterior two-third of your tongue. So if you take this orange color, anterior two-third of your tongue. Now what will happen? Subsequently, your posterior one-third of the tongue is derived from your copula and all this. Okay, so from your second, third and fourth pharyngeal arches. So the mucous membrane and the body of the anterior two-third of the tongue is derived from the cells of your first pharyngeal arch. Whereas your posterior one third of the tongue is derived from your copula. That is why if you take your anterior two third, if you take, it is mainly supplied by your lingual nerve, your general sensation. Why? Because the nerve that is going to be formed from the first pharyngeal arch is lingual nerve. We saw just now your anterior two third of the tongue is going to come from your cells of your first pharyngeal arch, meaning your later lingual swelling and your tuberculum impact. Okay, so along with that nerve is also going to develop. So your anterior two-third of your tongue is supplied by your lingual nerve. And if you take posterior one-third, we have your glossopharyngeal nerve. Why? Because it is the nerve of your second pharyngeal arch. Okay, and posterior most, if you take, we have the internal laryngeal nerve because your epiglottal swelling, which is derived from your fourth pharyngeal arch, is related to your laryngeal nerve. Okay. So this is what it is. So as far as your tongue is concerned, important to say, short notes, your muscles and all. Clinical anatomy, I hope you understood. If you have any doubts, you can post in the comments. I'll reply. At this point of time, I would like to thank my friends 
who helped me in uh, making this uh, session possible with their diagram contribution. If you have any doubts, you can post in the comments. I will reply it within some time. Thank you all. See you in the next session.